When it launched in 2016, Gears of War 4 marked a turning point for the Gears franchise. It was at this point that the Coalition took over franchise development duties, delivering a gorgeous but rather safe installment in the series. It was abundantly clear, however, that the team understands Gears inside and out. But with Gears 5, it was time to take things further. The run-up to launch has left many questions, but the result is a surprisingly ambitious take on the series, pushing the gameplay into uncharted territory while delivering perhaps the most advanced and performant Unreal Engine 4 game to date. Thus today we're going to explore the visuals in Gears 5, highlighting the ways in which the team has pushed Unreal Engine 4 to its limits. Beyond this, Gears 5 is the first game in the series to launch with a 60 frames per second target across all modes from day one, at least if you're playing on Xbox One X. So how does it fare overall, and what can you expect from the Xbox One S? We'll explore all this and more on this episode of Digital Foundry, so grab your retro lancer and suit up. It's time for Gears. Gears of War is a series that has always been synonymous with pushing technical boundaries. From the very first game on Xbox 360 through its various sequels, each game has served as a showpiece for Unreal Engine and the talented developers working on each project. I'll never forget seeing Gears of War for the first time back in 2006. It was a moment that redefined my expectations for what visuals could be. Gears 5, however, offers perhaps one of the greatest leaps in fidelity the series has experienced to date, with a wide range of impressive new visual features on offer alongside some serious optimization. The level of detail on display in each area is extremely impressive, especially when you consider the frame rate and resolution targets. So let's begin there, the resolution. In the case of Gears 5, the solution to rendering quality is a complex one, utilizing a range of techniques that have become increasingly common this generation. So first and foremost, Gears 5 uses a dynamic resolution system, as you'd expect, and this is applied on both Xbox One X and the base system. On Xbox One X, this tops out at a native 4K resolution, while base Xbox is 1080p. This value is adjusting regularly during gameplay, however, producing results on X such as 1584p, 1728p, 2160p, and the like. Xbox One Base then is quarter resolution in comparison, which includes values such as 792p, 864p, all the way up to Full HD. But this is just the start. Gears 5 utilizes a temporal upscaling solution, so resolution values aren't quite as clear cut. Essentially, view geometry is adjusted dynamically based on the load using dynamic resolution. This is then upscaled to match the final output, such as 4K in the case of Xbox One X. That's standard stuff, right? But what's different here is that all post-processing is applied after this upscale. This can include effects such as motion blur, bloom, tone mapping, and the like, not to mention the HUD and basic UI. So basically, geometry rendering varies in resolution, but post effects are always rendered at full resolution. It is effectively another clever solution for delivering a clean image without always reaching the highest pixel counts. We've seen similarly great solutions from games such as Insomniac Spider-Man, and of course it works great here. This is a great feature of Unreal Engine 4. Unlike Gears 4, however, Xbox One X only has one display option. The game is designed to target 60 frames per second at all times in all modes, so there's no way to target a higher resolution at 30 frames per second. I do feel aiming for 60 was the right move, however, but some users might enjoy the option for a sustained higher resolution. But of course, there's much more to Gears 5 than image quality, so let's examine some of the details that set this game apart from its prequel and indeed many other Unreal Engine 4 titles. Before we dive into the nitty gritty details of what makes Gears 5's visuals so special though, I should mention the differences between Xbox One X and the base system. We've already established the resolution difference. But what about the rest? Well, I'm happy to report that, visually speaking, the games are nearly identical, at least in terms of assets and effects quality. 
There may be some subtle changes and tweaks made to ensure slightly better performance on the base system, but by and large, they look just about the same. So really, the main benefit here stems entirely from the massive boost in resolution, and of course the doubling of the frame rate in campaign. With that out of the way though, let's take a look at some of the game's visual features. It of course begins with character rendering, the key to any third person action game such as Gears. And Gears 5 shakes things up right from the start. Following its introductory credit sequence, which is pre-recorded video, the game drops into a gorgeous series of cutscenes. But unlike Gears 4, every single story driven cutscene in the game is rendered entirely in real time in engine which is especially impressive when you consider how complex sequences can get. Moments like this where the camera quickly cuts between different shots with no visible texture popping while impressively detailed destruction is unleashed. The characters of course take center stage here and this is where we see our first major improvement over Gears 4. Each character has received a roughly 50% increase in overall polygon count. As a result, edges are now smoother with few visible polygon edges present in any single scene. In building the characters this time, however, artists also reworked facial features and details to more accurately simulate the appearance of light playing off and shining through the skin. So let's pause for a moment and take all this in with JD here. It's a very realistic depiction of a human face to be sure, but there's a lot going on. First, there's the skin. The specularity of the skin simulates the play of light off its surface, and Gears 5 now supports dual lobe specularity. By using dual specular roughness values, you can create a more natural skin with a sheen associated with natural skin oil. This is all about how light bounces off the skin and plays off the different pores within it. Then of course there's backscattering, which is the simulation of light transmission through a surface, in this case such as JD's ear. It's a natural phenomenon, and the implementation here in Gears 5 is more accurate and realistic than what we saw in the previous game. In addition, the eye shader has also been improved with proper light scattering below the surface, dynamic iris caustics, and more. The objective is to create a more realistic eye, which is key to natural character rendering. In addition to the facial features then, there's a lot of attention poured into things such as armor and clothing. Materials are now more natural and unified on the back end, allowing the artists to build clothing which more closely simulates metal, leather, and cloth. The metal in this scene, for instance, displays chipped edges with micro-abrasions glistening realistically in the light. This is driven by a slot-based system, which allows a lot of freedom in this area. But Gears 5 takes things further during gameplay. The team includes a separate dynamic slot specifically for temporary material effects. That means things such as ice and snow, blood splatter, and goo can appear as a layer on top of the character based on the situation in which they find themselves. All of this helps increase realism in battle and traversal. The animation and acting also see a noticeable boost in cutscenes. According to the Coalition, they switched over to facewear middleware, which allows not only performance capture of facial expressions during motion capture, but also facial capture during separate voiceover sessions. By taking this animation data and carefully tweaking it per scene, the results appear more lifelike and natural. Taken all together then, the cinematic character rendering in Gears 5 I feel is among the best in the industry right now, standing tall alongside the likes of Naughty Dog. It's impressive stuff and it's great to see all of it done fully in real time. All of this is of course combined with other high quality effects work, both in cinematics and gameplay. For one, Unreal's motion blur is top class here, producing clean, artifact-free velocity motion blur that looks remarkably realistic during cutscenes and excellent during gameplay. It's key to achieving that pseudo pre-rendered look, and the shutter speed is just perfect for this game. In addition, an updated depth of field solution is utilized during these cinematics that is of higher quality than Gears of War 4's insane quality depth of field that was only available on PC you get high quality, performant, bokeh depth of field across all platforms, and it looks fantastic. The fact that we've exceeded insane quality from Gears 4 on consoles is a great achievement indeed. But while characters are rendered in all their beefy glory, it's the environments that really steal the show. 
Gears is a series that is always focused on delivering a high level of micro detail within richly detailed environments, packed full of objects in each scene. The series has always focused on what they call destroyed beauty. Now Gears 5 certainly adheres to this and feels like a natural evolution in many ways, but the team has seen fit to greatly expand the color palette and scene variety. As a result, this is a game which ditches the overwhelmingly brown palette in favor of vibrant blues, greens, and reds, depending on the scene. This is best experienced in HDR, where Gears 5 takes the crown as perhaps the best implementation of HDR of experience to date, right up there with the likes of Gran Turismo Sport. The game looks decidedly different and to my eyes superior when playing in HDR mode. To achieve this, machine learning was utilized to train an inverse tone mapper for color space conversion based on a large set of HDR and SDR images from other first party Xbox games. Essentially, the team was able to use brute force computing power to further refine the visual output in HDR mode. But now it's time to begin our journey through the game world, starting here on this ruined island paradise packed with snarling branches and dilapidated facilities stretching off far into the distance. This very first scene drops you into a crystal clear pool of water. Light pierces the surface dancing across the bottom of this crystal clear pool. Screen space reflections allow the surrounding environment and characters then to reflect off its surface. Detailed ruins and foliage encircle this pool of water, blowing gently in the breeze. Volumetric lighting simulates light scattering through the atmosphere as it pours through the opening above the player. This atmospheric rendering gives the impression of density within the air, and it's a feature used throughout the game. From beams of light piercing a dark cavern, and low-hanging fog visible in the distance, to the dust and debris lit by the low-hanging sun, the volumetric fog system contributes greatly to the game's atmosphere. And it's here that we move into the second area of the game, which presents a more familiar location for the Gear series with a detailed urban landscape and loads of building interiors to explore. The level of detail on display is certainly impressive. Small things such as these snack packs on the stand feature impressively high resolution artwork. And who doesn't love the signage created for these fictional stores? Certain textures also receive extra depth thanks to cone step mapping. The idea? To simulate how light interacts with the material surface in three dimensions. At such a large scale, it doesn't make sense to render these out as geometry, so instead, techniques like this are utilized. This simulates geometric surface detail by shading chunks based on depth and surface normal information that is placed on the desired mesh, such as this wall here. The results appear very similar to parallax occlusion mapping, but the quality is improved and the performance is higher. As with Gears 4, the fifth game in the series utilizes the same geocache system, allowing impressive scripted destruction and set pieces. Artists can create these sequences and then play them back in real time using the GPU. It's a predefined animation, but the results look remarkable in motion. The next biome we visit in Gears 5 then are the Icy Plains, an area which offers both new rendering features and gameplay concepts. One key feature here is deformation. A fully deformable snow material was crafted allowing characters and objects alike to leave accurate trails behind. A tessellation shader is run on this local deformation, allowing the paths around the player to appear smooth and artifact free, while a normal map is generated dynamically from this data, allowing the deformation to remain visible even at a great distance. If we briefly jump to the next area, the desert, note how the tracks remain visible far off into the distance and for a lengthy period of time, while width varies depending on which type of object created the tracks. The skiff here leaves a different trail pattern than characters and enemies, for instance. And while we're discussing environmental interactions, there's also another system enabling destructive elements during gameplay. This was achieved using what the team calls Swift Destruction. This allows pre-fractured mesh objects to be destroyed using a vertex shader, and this is likely how destructible cover functions in the game. And the concept of destructible cover is interesting and highlights another fascinating gameplay feature in Gears 5, breakable ice. In certain areas, frozen ponds can be used to your advantage. Shoot the ice, 
it breaks and the enemies fall in. Over time, this does refreeze, but it's a neat addition that is visually convincing. Gears 5, of course, features GPU accelerated particles that also use vertex shaders, reducing the CPU impact to zero. This is called Swift Particles, and it was used to create all the various environmental visual effects seen throughout the game. When looking at all these different effects and techniques, then you can see that it all kind of comes together to create a more interactive and reactive environment. Another important feature though for rendering are the shadows. While Gears 4 relied partially on pre-calculated shadows and per-object shadows, Gears 5 is entirely dynamic across the board. It utilizes cascaded shadow maps, but where things get really interesting is how it handles distance shadows. Specifically, Gears 5 offers ray-traced shadows derived from a scene representation using distance fields. So how does this impact the visuals? Well, there are examples of this technique out there which showcase the difference between using a cascaded shadow map by itself and combining it with distance field shadows. It basically allows more natural, accurate soft shadows visible across more objects at a distance. Another neat trick relating to shadows can be observed here, transparency shadows from the skiff. It's a difficult thing to simulate normally, and it's likely implemented here using artist trickery, but the results are surprisingly effective and it looks awesome. Honestly though, I could just keep going on and on about the visuals here. There's just so much to discuss and I can't possibly fit everything into this video. But there are a few other things I want to quickly mention, such as the excellent lighting, including dynamic spotlights like those used on Jack while exploring darker environments. As the light source moves around the environment, shadows are also cast along with it, which you can also see here along with these gorgeous reflections and material work. Speaking of reflections, screen space reflections are used on vertical surfaces sometimes as well, such as these mirrors which is a difficult thing to pull off as there is no screen space data for the front of the character model obviously, but some nice shader usage and a little fudging goes a long way to making it look good. Or how about the animation when driving the skiff over the snow and sand? The way you carve up the terrain just feels right, it looks great. Or how about the capsule shadows visible here in this scene? As his hand hovers over the surface of the table, you'll notice an extra shadowed region within the shadow that becomes darker depending on his distance. And I haven't even touched on the quality of the materials themselves, from stonework to tiles to cement to wood. Everything is beautifully crafted and surprisingly realistic despite the hyper-realistic proportions of most items within the world of Gears. So yeah, there's just a lot of details here to observe if you're willing to look closely. But at this point, I feel that we've established that Gears 5 is a great looking game with a smart solution to resolution and a great attention to detail where it counts. But what about performance? Well, this is the first time in series history that a new Gears game has targeted 60 frames per second for the campaign on day one, on a console of course. Gears 4 has a 1080p 60 mode on Xbox One X, but the resolution and level of detail is much higher in the sequel, thus we were curious to see how it would hold up. For the tests then, we have a series of sections all taken from the campaign on both Xbox One X and Xbox One S. It might surprise you to learn that Gears 5 also includes a split-screen multiplayer option for up to three people during the campaign. And yes, I'll test that as well. So let's start with Xbox One X. The results are certainly promising right from the start. Exploration and light combat tends to play out exactly as you would expect at a mostly steady 60 frames per second with an occasional dip here and there. This is the average level of performance across the run of play, and looking at each tested clip, the average frame rate reported by our software was around 59.1 frames per second. But that doesn't mean it's perfect. Take this battle here in the courtyard. Immediately the game starts to fall below the target frame rate, while an adaptive V-Sync solution introduces mild screen tearing along the top portion of the screen. When this occurs, you'll definitely feel it, and it does lose some of the fluidity that you get from most other areas in the game, but it usually doesn't go too far below this point. If we jump over to a more wintry battle then, the results are slightly better overall, and this is more in line with the level of performance during most battles in the game. Minor dips, but overall very steady. It's similar to Doom 2016 on Xbox One X, in fact. Ah. 
This next battle is interesting then, as it also demonstrates how performance can sometimes be worse right at the start of the battle. In this scene, the enemies are already present in the world upon arrival, and the initial portion of the fight runs below the target frame rate. Give it a little time, however, and eventually it evens out, retaining a stable level of performance for the rest of the fight. So my overall impression then is that it's very stable on Xbox One X, but not quite perfect. It's typically what we see with 60 FPS console shooters, however, so if you are okay with typical Call of Duty campaigns, Doom 2016, or Wolfenstein 2, you'll be fine with Gears 5. Then there's the split screen. In this mode, the game is reduced to 30 frames per second on Xbox One X, and like in single player mode, an adaptive V-Sync is used. The visuals remain impressively detailed in this mode and performance is reasonably stable, but certain scenes can result in dips below the 30 FPS line. Keep in mind that it's relatively uncommon for shooters like this to maintain perfect performance in split screen mode, and really, it's quite stable overall. It's great that the Coalition has decided to include split screen since it's something we don't often find in modern games like this. It's extremely challenging to implement, I've been told, so it's quite an achievement. Overall though, Xbox One X gets a thumbs up from me for performance in Gears 5, but what about the Xbox One S? Well, expectedly the frame rate in single player is dropped to 30 frames per second like Gears 4, which has been the standard frame rate for the series thus far. Impressively, the performance is extremely stable. An occasional torn frame can be observed along the top of the image, and the frame rate does sometimes dip just below 30, but by and large, it's basically locked. And this holds true for all the scenes that I tested, in fact. Honestly, it runs better than all of the Xbox 360 iterations in the franchise, and is pretty much on par with Gears 4. Considering the number of issues noted in many modern Xbox One releases these days when run on the base hardware, it's a solid turnout. That said, split screen isn't quite as positive, but it's not difficult to understand why. Firstly, motion blur is now disabled in this mode, and it's likely that other visual elements take a mild hit as well, including resolution. Even then, the average frame rate is often below 30 frames per second during even basic traversal. It's clear that this mode is hugely taxing on the hardware. It's just about what you'd expect. So yeah, aside from the split-screen performance on Xbox One S, overall performance is excellent in the game. Unfortunately, we didn't really have time to play the multiplayer modes this time out, but if the beta and Gears 4 are an indication, it should run even more consistently in those modes, and on Xbox One S, you'll get 60 FPS multiplayer just like Gears 4. So that's a brief look at the visuals and performance in Gears 5, but I also wanted to quickly discuss the game itself. As a fan of the series, I was very interested to see where the team was taking it, and I'm not disappointed. Yes, the core Gears gameplay is still very much here and it's extremely refined, but there are new elements which change things for me. Firstly, the encounters themselves. In a typical Gears game, you roll up to a new location, locusts spawn, then you fight them until they're gone. Simple. The enemy always initiates combat. Gears 5, however, now features encounters that more closely resembles something like Halo, where the enemies are already present in the environment as you arrive. Consider the sleeping grunts in Halo 1. It doesn't have a huge impact on the overall gameplay, but it allows you to use a limited stealth system to get a leg up on the enemy before taking the rest on, and it alters the overall mood and atmosphere in a positive way. Secondly, there's the open world areas, and this too reminds me of the original Halo. If you recall, the second stage in that game, known as Halo, had players coyoodling around in a warthog with three objective markers which you could visit out of order. Upon arrival at an objective marker, you'd engage in Halo-style combat, of course, but these moments between the battles helped flesh out the world while offering enjoyable driving mechanics. And that's exactly what we have here in Gears 5. This isn't trying to be an open world game with busy work and fetch quests, rather, it's a chance for the game to sort of stretch its legs. The skiff itself is a blast to pilot, much like the Warthog, and in fact, it reminds me almost of a simplified take on SSX. 
It really lends the game a different style of pacing with longer quiet areas between combat zones. It's an interesting change. Now when you take all these changes together and combine them with beautiful scenery, interesting encounters, and that classic Gears gameplay, you have something that feels familiar yet fresh, and I for one greatly enjoyed it. But that's pretty much it for the moment. I really had a great time playing through the campaign, it's one of the best looking games on Xbox, and it runs like a dream while evolving the series in an interesting way. It's not a perfect game, but what is? If you've ever enjoyed a Gears title, I can't recommend Gears 5 enough. Plus, there's still Horde Mode among others to dive into, which I look forward to checking out over the next week or so. But if you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and subscribe, ring the notification bell at the top, and follow us over on Twitter. And until next time, this is John signing off.